Worldwide Bible study, May 18th, the life of Jacob with Martin Luther. We're into it. We are in Genesis 27, verse 15. Uh, so that is, uh, so, so we're deep into the, into the plot here. We'll remember that the Lord had promised that the, the older will serve the younger. Now, that's a kind of an amazing thing because they're twins, right? Jacob and Esau are twins. And yet, uh, one has to be born before the other. They can't be born at the same time. So Esau is the older, according to their birth order. And yet, uh, Rebecca is trusting this promise that Esau will serve Jacob. But Isaac and Esau, they all have forgotten that promise. And they're all about the, mm, the strength and the glory that, you know, Esau is a strong, he's a hunter and so forth. So Jacob, uh, so Jacob and uh, uh, Rebecca are plotting now to get the birthright. And, uh, and they do it in this way. The, uh, uh, Isaac had said to Esau, hey, why don't you go hunting and bring me some really nice food? And then we'll have the ordination ceremony for you. We will, uh, I'll ordain you. And so Rebecca says, okay, quick, Isaac. Uh, sorry, quick, Jacob, let's cook some goat and bring it in. And you're going to pretend like you're your brother Esau. And, and then your father will give you the blessing, which he should be doing in the first place. We shouldn't have to trick him into doing this, but he's not paying attention to the prophetic word. So we're going to do it. And so they come up with this plot. Now, remember, it's kind of great that, that Luther says, boy, this plot is a terrible plot because they don't even think about like the, the fact that, that Jacob's voice is different than Esau's voice. They don't even think about the beard that, uh, that Esau has and the smooth shaven face of Jacob. Just compare me and Pastor Nauman. I've been to Jacob. He's the Esau. Although I imagine Esau's beard is a lot uh, hairier than Pastor Nauman's. So they, so, but remember, Luther says the whole, they, they're hastily doing this, but it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't, uh, uh, it's kind of a foolish plot, but the Lord's, uh, man, I, I love this, this note from last week where faith devours not only our sins, but also our rashness, our foolishness, our thoughtlessness of the saints. So with this intent to bless and serve and so forth uh, is, um, is what really matters. Okay, so that takes us to verse 15. Rebecca took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. Now, these garments are going to be priestly garments. And this is an important thing so that, so who gets to wear the alb and the, the chasuble and so forth? Uh, and that's, what's, that's what this is going on. The second ceremony is added by Moses. It involved fine and precious apparel. That's the meaning of the Hebrew word, ha desirable, precious, frequently employed in Holy Scripture. To Daniel, the angel says, you are greatly beloved a dear and esteemed man, the centurion in the gospel account, he had a slave who was worthy, dear, precious slave. So Rebecca brought out those fine and magnificent garments, the live and show on hair licking kind of, I don't know what that means. These priestly garments, which undoubtedly were very beautiful, described by Moses, for they use special attire at their religious rites, just as we do in our churches. We call it or not, vestments. These Rebecca has with her in the house, and from this it is evident that Esau had not yet been established in his position, even though he was in possession of it and governed the church. So um, I remember, for example, when I was ordained, um, one of the gifts that Carrie and, our, and my family gave to me was a red stole, and that stole at my ordination was placed upon me. It's an interesting thing, isn't it, that you, you, you get a garment or something like that to indicate your office. Uh, I got a last or two weeks ago or whatever. I got a hood that went with the 
the uh, the doctor thing. It's you, the the garments are in, indicative. The, you, the Supreme Court, you know, you have your robes that you're wearing, or when you, so that there's certain clothes that belong to the office, and this is how it is then in the Old Testament as well. So these are not just fancy clothes; they're uh, they're clothes that indicate the office, and we still do it now. It's one of the things that um, this is an interesting question. Why? Um, we, so a lot of people will come and they see our uh, robes, the Lutheran church, the guys wearing the robes, and they're like, oh, just like the Catholics. Well, uh, I had a long question, conversation last week uh, with someone about this, but because there's two different, there's two different approaches to the history, to the, because th these robes are not commanded in the scripture, although we see it in the Old Testament, they were commanded. They're not commanded in the New Testament, but neither are they forbidden in the New Testament. And so you have two very different approaches to tradition. Uh, we have the uh, we have the, the the Lutheran Church, part of the Magisterial Reformation, has a tradition of if it's not forbidden by the Scripture, then we want to keep it. We have that generous view of tradition. A lot of the Anabaptists they have the idea if it's not commanded in the Scriptures, we can't do it. So that would be a lot of your evangelical churches and Bible churches and things like that. Uh, so, so we, so we keep, you know, robes, we, it's not forbidden. So we keep it. Why not? Okay. Uh, let's see. Annotate. So, uh, he does not have the vestments in his control. Uh, they're there in the house. Esau is not wearing them yet. Rebecca, who took possession of the vestments and kept them undoubtedly guarding, guarded against this by special design, although the vestments belong to the father Isaac, for she waited for the opportunity to turn them over to him who would receive the fiefs from his father and would be established in his succession. So here's the ordinary, the, uh, 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 Isaac is going to give to Esau these vestments. I just saw Steve says, I received a hard hat and safety glasses. Right, that's the idea. Uh, so, uh, but Rebecca is kind of keeping them away from the kids so that because she doesn't want them to be given to Esau she she knows they belong to Jacob verse 16 and the skins of the kids she put uh, baby goats please here she put on the uh uh on the hands uh, why do we call baby goats kids we don't call like calves cow kids or ducklings duck kids I think that's funny by the way how all these animals get different, like a flock or a herd or a, anyway. Uh, the skins of the kids she put on his hands and upon the smooth part of his neck, she gave the savory food and bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. So he went into his father and said, ah, ah, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? It's strange, Luther says, the mother puts the skins only around the neck and does not also cover his face. The only thing that occurred to her was that he would have to hold out his hands to his father and that if he had to give his father a kiss, the latter in turn would put his arms around his son's neck. For this reason, she wanted these two parts especially to be covered, but she thinks that the smooth face cannot easily be noticed since Isaac has a beard and would be kissed on his beard. Moreover, while... While uh, decking him out, she perhaps also reminded him to imitate Esau's voice as carefully as he could, lest his father distinguish between the voice of Esau and the voice of Jacob, since he immediately asks, who are you, my son? And Esau, are you Esau whom I've sent to hunt? It seems to me that I'm hearing the voice of Jacob. Jacob answers his father in a long speech. And his father listens intently to, uh, intently to it and finally reaches the following conclusion. Oh, sorry, I didn't read the scriptures. Jacob says to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Jacob answers his father in a long speech, and his father listens intently to it and finally reaches the following conclusion. Now, remember, uh, Isaac at this point is he can't see hardly at all. He's almost blind. 
So his, everything is happening with his ears. Uh, he reaches the following conclusion. The voice is Jacob's. The hands are Esau's. But when Jacob says that he is the firstborn, this is a plain lie. Furthermore, he hurried rather unwisely, for his mother did not foresee that this speed would arouse his father's suspicion. Therefore, Isaac says, how is it that you found it so quickly? Remember, they, they wanted to get this done before Esau got back. So they had to hurry things up. But that hurried plot, Jacob was like, is uh, Isaac is like, wait, wait a minute. How did you go hunt and find the game and dress the game and cook the game and do all this so quickly? This one blow is very hard and Isaac is reminded of deception and a trick. How is it you're returning so quickly from the hunt? Have you been able to hunt and catch game so soon? If you had returned in the evening or tomorrow, you would have been quickly enough. Jacob answers, the Lord God granted me success. It's true. Now, this is, an, this is where Luther is very Luthery. God must take the responsibility. Jacob lies magnificently. He says that he had hunted the game, although he had taken two kids in the stable. But Isaac is silent and feigns ignorance because he is unconcerned and fully confident that it's impossible for him to be deceived by the son or by the mother. So Isaac is so guileless in the whole thing that he, he's ready to believe whatever is told to him because how could it be otherwise? But he starts to, it seems like he might start to sniff it out here. Verse 21, Isaac says to Jacob, Come near, that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice. But the hands are the hands of Esau. So what's he going to think? This is another blow. And one that's far more serious to the to the plot here, to the to the to getting the blessing. Now things look bad. He. Jacob is commanded to draw near in order that his father may touch him. He sweats profusely and silently found fault with his mother's plan. Oh, dear mother, what have you done? What to what have you driven me? After he has come that near, he hears his father say, the voice is Jacob's, the voice, the voice. <laughs> this is, this is how things go in the conscience. There's, the conscience is an echo room. I don't know if you've noticed that. But if something, is, if something is troubling your conscience, it doesn't just trouble you once. It, it's over and over and over and over and over. Like a, a, so the conscience is a, a, an echo chamber. And, so, and, and Luther captures that here. He hears the voice, the voice, the voice, the voice. And he, uh, and he thinks, oh, now I've done it. Uh, I'm, I'm caught. Not, and not only am I going to receive, I'm not going to receive the blessing, but I'm going to be cursed. Luther says, at that point, I would have let the dish fall and would have run as though my head were on fire. <laughs> it's over. The game's over. Whoosh. You know, Luther. <laughs> Luther. I would have got rid of that dish and I would have taken to my heels at once. For Isaac's on the right track that will lead to discovery of the deception when he notes the difference between the voice and the voice, and that blow should have awakened him. So, so the, uh, Isaac there, you know, he's, he's blind, he can't see, but wait a minute, something fishy's going on here. Ah, it's Jacob, not Esau. But he sinks back into sleep and thinks that there is uh, shamming of some kind because of what Esau is imitating his brother's voice. Now, this is an interesting, I, I, I don't know, I don't know if Luther's right about this or not, but he says, well, so what is it if it's Esau there, but I hear Jacob, well, what's going on? Well, maybe Esau is just making fun of his brother. I, that's Luther's thing. I, I don't know. Jacob approaches confidently and hears these words. Here then the plan of Rebecca and Jacob ends. Indeed, it makes a false step. 
so that so, so their plot their whole deal it falls short but god brings it about i do not know why god is all capital letters here in the text if someone knows if someone can explain why god here is all capital letters then please put that in the chat God brings it about that Isaac is intent on his duty of blessing and removes this blows from his mind. So the Lord, the Lord takes it out of Isaac's mind that he's being deceived and so that the Lord is going to see the plot go through in spite of the, the bumbling of Rebekah and Jacob. But now all this must be applied to our instruction in order that we may learn how great the power of faith is, and that to him who believes all things are possible. For faith causes that which does not exist to exist, and makes possible everything that is impossible. This should remind us of Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, why don't we look at Hebrews 11 when we finish this paragraph? You've seen Rebecca's foolishness and rashness, how she decked out her son Jacob to deceive his father and put skins of kids around his hands and neck in order that his father might think that Jacob is actually hairy. The situation is full of danger inasmuch as Jacob trembles and turns away from his mother's plans. Lest perchance my father touch me, he says, and be aware, and I bring upon myself a curse instead of a blessing. But the faith of this very pious woman is so great that it forces its way through all this. See, th so that... Why is there success here? Because the plot was so watertight? No, the plot was dumb. <laughs> because they're such good trickers? No, they're bad at this. And we should be bad at this. We should be very bad at lying and tricking and deceiving. <laughs> I mean, it's something that that we sort of shake our heads at Isaac and uh, at Rebecca and Jacob here and say, you, you guys don't know what you're doing. And they would say, well, of course we don't know what we're doing. We're Christians. We're, we are not supposed to be any good at this. But faith is the thing that makes the difference. Now, I think I mentioned last week that I, I'm uh, a little bit nervous about this because um, because it seems a little bit like the word of faith, as if faith itself is a force. So let's just make sure we get it from the scriptures. This is Hebrews chapter 11, where this, this, the, the, the power and the wonder of faith are unfolded for us. Some, I've heard this chapter called the Hall of Faith, uh, which, like, instead of the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Faith which is kind of cute. And I kind of, I kind of like that. And it's going to define faith and then talk about all those who had faith uh, and all the gifts that it give, that it gave. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So that faith, so that faith is, is going to be different than sight. Paul says in second corinthians somewhere it might be second corinthians six or seven or eight right in the middle part of second corinthians we walk by faith and not by sight so that faith is sometimes contrasted with works but faith is also contrasted with sight because faith has to do with the promise by it by what by it by faith the people of old received their commendation by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what was seen was not made out of things that were visible. Rather, they were made out of the, the word. That's an amazing, that's an amazing thing, by the way. And, and this, I was at a, uh, uh, last week we went up to Kansas City and I got to do a, a well, a bunch of things, but one of them was a Q and A with the high school kids, and uh, and the first question that they asked was, 
how old is the earth? Did God really create the world in six days? This is a big, it's still a big question. It's always been a big question, by the way. It's always been a, a controversial question. We, we feel the pressure of it because of the, because uh, everyone's crazy about evolution these days. And uh, uh, they love to be evolutionists. <laughs> Lois found the verse. Thank you. We walk by faith, not by sight. First Corinthians five, seven. I was one chapter off or five chapters off, depending. I gave a four chapter range and I wasn't in it. So th th this, 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 how, was, how did, how did everything get here? You know, how is all the stuff stuff? How were the things things? Why does, why does, why does existence exist? And this, is, this verse is so important for us, is that by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Now, you do not, I do not think you need faith to know that the universe is created. It's just too amazing. But you do have to have faith to know how it was created or by what, through what was it created? The word of God. And that the things that are visible are made out of things not visible. That's an amazing thing to me, by the way. Like, I've been trying to think about this the last nine months. How does, uh, it, started with a, it started with our study of angels. Uh, we were doing a study of angels probably four or five years ago. And the question is, how do angels affect things on earth? Like, how can a spiritual thing affect a, a, vis, a, a, a material thing how can an angel kill a person like remember the angel of the lord or the, at the passover where the angel of the lord protected the city of jerusalem at the time of isaiah how can the angel how can a spiritual being interact with physical things but then like that's a tricky question but you realize that's the same as our soul and body like my soul is meditating on these words and thinking of the things to say and it affects my mouth to say them and my lungs to put the air out there and everything how does that happen that's the same fantastic mystery of creation that the lord created everything out of nothing he speaks and then all of a sudden there is blam so that this the spiritual things are the effect of spirit of, of the physical reality and that the two are bound up together. How? I don't know. Maybe Thomas Aquinas figured it out. But here we believe it by faith. That's the point. We confess this amazing truth. What was uh, the universe was created by the word of God so that the things made, the visible came from the invisible. The visible came from the invisible. Woo! That's creation ex nihilo from nothing. And then Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews, Paul is going to go through all of the characters here and, and outline how their faith is what made the difference. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he dies, he still speaks. Abel still speaks to us. He still preaches. Beautiful. By faith, Enoch, let me, let me highlight him this way. Uh-oh. It's very tricky to highlight one word in this program, by the way. By faith, Enoch, green is a topic highlight, uh, was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Remember Enoch walked with God and he was no more. Whoop. There's two people this way in the Old Testament. Enoch, yoop, and Elijah, who got a, the chariots, which is kind of cool. Before he was taken up, he was commended as having pleased God. 
No, so why was so why was uh, Enoch taken up into heaven? Well, because he made God happy. And how did he make God happy? He made God happy because he believed his promise. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. First of all, you can't draw near to nothing. And that he rewards those who seek him. In other words, that God is and that God is good and gracious. Now, in other words, I can't uh, approach God if I think that he's going to destroy me. If I'm, gonna, if I'm drawing near to God, it's because I'm convinced that there's something good there, not something bad. And so I believe that God is and that God is good. And the only way I can get to that goodness of God, by the way, is the death of Jesus. I mean, that's why faith and the cross are so bound up to each other. Because apart from the, de the death of Jesus, apart from forgiveness, uh, then God is angry. He's, go he's good, but he's angry at me because of my sin. If he's going to give me something, a uh, bless me, it has to be because my sins are atoned for. So all so this is, faith is all of these things. It's beautiful. By faith, Noah, here's Noah, being warned by God concerning events un, yet unseen. See how it's this unseen reality that's there? He was warned by God of the flood that's coming. And remember, it had never even rained before. Can you imagine how hard it would be to understand a flood? If you had never seen rain, hmm. by faith, Noah, being warned of God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear, ooh, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world. You know, I just realized this. We, I, I've been saying for a long time, we practice household baptism which is really great, household baptism. And I was, I was uh, doing this political interview a couple of weeks ago talking about faith and, and uh, things. And, and this guy zinged me because he was talking about the Philippian jailer. jailer uh, and he said something about the first thing he does. And I said, you know, the first thing he did is baptize his babies because it says household baptism. And this guy zinged me back and said, does your household have babies in it? Uh, and I said, no. So alas but i should have said well uh if there were babies i wouldn't throw them out you know noah didn't have any babies in the household but if there were babies they would have been on the ark <laughs> okay okay you're too young you're too young to be in the ark you have to go you have to you have to swim on your own unless you can choose to come on the ark the babies you put the babies down and say babies would you like to come onto the ark Come on. And that ark is baptism. That's what Peter tells us. I like that connection. Just thought of it. Is someone... Gallia says, what is household baptism? That means that uh, when people, when the head of household were, were being baptized, so I think it's two or four times in the book of Acts. It's, it's twice in Philippi. Uh, the... Well, why not look at it? Well, we're... Sorry, we're too many rabbit trails. But if you look at Acts chapter, uh, is it Acts chapter 19, when Paul goes to uh, uh, Philippi and Lydia becomes a Christian and she and her whole household are baptized and then he's jailed and the doors are open, but he stays in jail and the jailer's about to fall on his sword, but Paul stops him and he becomes a Christian. And then the jailer, takes Paul to his house and he and his whole household are baptized. So when the head of house becomes Christian, the whole, all the people are baptized. Acts 16, thank you. Uh, if there was no rain before Noah, where they get, the water was up from the ground. It seems like the whole world was like this big greenhouse. So they had water covering and you had mists coming up from the ground that would water the plants. By this, he condemned the world. Ooh. 
Noah condemned the world. Well, you think God condemned the world, and he did, but it was Noah's faith. He became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith, the righteousness of faith, not the righteousness of works, the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out uh, from a place that he was about to receive as an inheritance. So it seems like Abraham was about to become king in Ur. And he went instead to inherit another place, the promised land. He didn't know where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promises, the seed promise to Isaac and Jacob. Uh, he, remember Abraham, this is an amazing thing, that Abraham, the only land he ever owned was the, was the tomb of Sarah, if I remember right. But look at how all of this is attributed to faith, to faith. By faith, Sarah herself received uh, power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. So that how did Sarah have promised to conceive Isaac? Faith is what Paul says. So that faith is accomplishing Faith is, is, is this, what does it say? Faith causes that which does not exist to exist. Now, the, the danger, okay, here, here's the danger, uh, which, is, which is what gets us close to the word of faith thing, is that the word of, and, and I don't understand these, these guys as well as I should have, but they understand uh, faith as a power in and of itself. So that um, if I think of, like, if I was reading Joel Osteen's Your Best Life Now or Every Day of Friday or one of these books, and, and, and this is like, um, it's like if you had, this is how I think they picture faith. Like, if you have a sheet, this is the universe, and you drop a marble in that, and so that now you have this dip in the sheet, and so all of the, all of the blessings flow down to you. So all the universe now starts to be, because you you create your own sort of gravity of good uh by faith so they they think faith is a power in and of itself we, we understand you no know, that faith is uh that faith is always connected to the promise to the promise of god and so the power is in the word the power is in the promise. The power is in God, and yet faith is what grabs a hold of that word, grabs a hold of that promise, so that, so that God has given Sarah the promise, see, the promise, but it's, but, but, but that pro, but it's faith that receives it. So Jesus is always saying things like, "Your faith has made you well." We're like, well, "Wait a minute, Jesus, you're the one that made them well." But if 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 here if, if God is here, and His Word is here, and I am here, that the thing that the Holy Spirit uses to, to put me here in the word and the blessing of the word, this thing is faith. So that, so that it's by faith that those blessings belong to us. We're talking about the same thing when it came to baptism, uh, be, because the, the question about baptism is, what about... Um, What's the connection between faith and baptism? And a lot of people, I was on another YouTube thing on, on Friday. These guys are trying to figure out what they believe in. and They're wrestling with infant baptism. And the question is, well, what about 
you know, babies and faith and everything else like this. So, so that most people understand, for example, baptism, you start with faith. This is the foundation, my trust in God. And then you build baptism on top of it. And the result is that, well, what happens if I lose my faith? What happens if my faith is destroyed? Well, then baptism is destroyed as well. And then I need to be, when my faith is, comes back, then I need to be baptized. I need to be baptized again and 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 again, again. But we, so we understand, no, it's the, it goes the opposite way, is that first we have the Lord's word, we have the promise of God, and that baptism is built on top of that. Sorry, let me, I should say it like this that that word and promise is delivered to us in baptism. And that faith is built on top of that. So that my faith is established on the word of God. My faith is resting on what the Lord has done. This faith, which is, has to do with my heart, is different than this baptism, which has to do with the with this objective word of God. What this does is it makes baptism just as subjective and internal as, as faith is, really. And so we want to we wanna see that first comes the word and then comes faith in that word. But, but then we cannot, we cannot miss the importance of this faith. We cannot overlook how, uh, how many times the Lord commends this faith as the, as, the, as the thing itself that's working. So that, so that even though baptism is what delivers the promise, the Lord is what does the work. It's our faith that's accounted to us as righteous, righteousness. So, so here in, in Hebrews. It, why, could, why could Sarah conceive? Why did she have power to conceive? Well, God promises it, but she believes it. And it's by faith that she received the power to conceive. It's by the word that the power to conceive is given. Therefore, from one man, Abraham, as good as dead, poor guy. You wonder if Abraham says, well, I wasn't. I mean, I was a little not dead. No, good is dead. We're born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of the sand of the she uh -oh. seashore. That's all. That's a tongue twister. These all died in faith, not having received the thing promised. Why was the thing promised was Jesus and the kingdom of God that would be in the shadow of the cross. But they saw them and greeted them from afar. How? Not by sight, but by faith. Having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the world. Ah, this is so great. Okay. It goes on and on and on. I want to go, I want to, go to this section here. This is one of my favorite sections. I, I think it seems like we've talked about this somewhat recently. Uh, what more shall I say? What time would fail to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, all the prophets who through faith, and look at the list of the things that they did through faith. They conquered kingdoms. They enforced justice. They obtained promises. This is getting better and better. They stopped the mouths of lions. Remember Daniel? They quenched the power of fire. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They escaped the edge of the sword. Remember King David? They were made strong out of weakness. That's just about everyone. They became mighty in war, all the judges and the kings. They put foreign armies to flight. Wow. Women received their dead by resurrection, Elijah and Elisha. Oops, 10. Uh, so that this is, it gets all the way to resurrection. I mean, and then it gets even better. <laughs> now we might not think so but this the, the the things accomplished by faith are ramping up and look at what it says some were tortured Ugh. refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life think of jeremiah 
Others suffered mocking and flogging, all the prophets, even chains and imprisonment. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, the prophets, they were stoned. They were sawn in two. Isaiah, that's the tradition of how Isaiah died. They were killed with the sword. Now, now look, look, look at this very interesting thing. Some uh, escaped the edge of the sword. Some did not. What do you think of that? Is it, it, see, it seems to us like, uh, you, you know, we're like, you know, I really like these effects of faith. Wait, wait, wait right there. <laughs> That's a bad line. Let me try that again. Don't worry. We'll see. I like, uh, I like, uh, I want to stop at torturing. Uh, uh, yeah, this, I like these. I, I want I want this through faith. And that's kind of the word of, man, oh man, am I going crazy. I, well, let me, one more time, one more time. To draw up, not like a kindergartner. I'm focused here. I'm trying to color within the lines. Okay. We like this part of faith. But this part, not so much. But this is the, this is the punchline right here. Sometimes the sword misses by faith. Sometimes the sword does not miss by faith. Sometimes uh, the dead are raised. Sometimes you're cut in two. See it? Sometimes, let's zap this all up here. So, Sometimes you conquer armies. Sometimes you wander about in skins of sheep and goats. Destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. You look at these guys. And girls, it's, it's, uh, it's both men and women here, wonderfully. Uh, Rahab is here. Sarah is here. The mother of Moses is here. So all these faithful men and women, they were afflicted. They were cut in half. They were poor. They refused to fight for their own release because they wanted to rise. They were thinking they had their mind on the resurrection. And the world was not worthy of them. This is incredible. So the question is, well, what does faith accomplish? Does it, does it accomplish all those nice good things? Or does it accomplish all these kind of fearful and ugly things? And the answer is yes. Yes. Eric says this is church persecution. That's exactly right. The martyrs. That's who they are. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, they were homeless, like Jesus was homeless. And yet the world was not worthy of them. I faith. I faith. Oof. All right, I, I just looked at the time. Uh, let me see if I can... Uh, that, that's actually probably a good spot to stop. Let me see where we are here. We are hairy hands... Uh, uh, did we get to this? But yes, we got just right to here. So let's stop it. Um, let me mark this at where we're done here. Because so we got to the point where uh, Jacob is uh, about to be caught, and the Lord, the, the Lord blinds Isaac so that he's going to give the blessing uh, to Jacob. Okay. Uh, any uh, Pastor Nauman, any questions to address before we? Uh, stop the recording. I think it would be good to address the performative word, as I think we conservative Lutherans would put it, but there are very, very limited contexts to this. So you have evangelicals who will say, you know, you can, you can really empower yourselves by even taking God's word 
and just saying these words and then God will do whatever you want. But that's that's like a genie kind of God, right? But but it's there like, are performative words. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we uh I forgive you all your sins. That's an actual effective word. When, when a Christian says your sins okay. are forgiven, that's uh, that's happening. Um, it's like a judge who says you're innocent, and that it's the word that actually makes you innocent. That's the uh, according to the law. So it is with us too. We, we don't we we don't want to get into the idea of magic though, like we're, like we're casting spells or something. Faith is not our words going out, but God's word coming to us. So, so faith is that the catching of what God is throwing. And we rejoice also that God, it's, uh, God gives us faith. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's our faith, but it also comes as a gift of God. Uh, like Paul says in, um, in Ephesians 2, by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourself, the grace not of yourself, the faith not of yourself, nothing is of, of yourself. It's a gift of God. So that the Lord throws us the baseball of his promise, and then he tosses us the glove of faith to catch the ball. So it's all the Lord's work start to finish. Great. I see Marcia says, so we're not so much looking forward to the resurrection. This is our uh, part of our sanctification part of our Christian life is the Lord is drawing our affections away from this world and toward the resurrection. And we're resistant of that. That's a hard thing because we think we're losing something. And I think we are, but the things that we're losing are things we're supposed to lose. So the Lord draws us. He's drawing our hope toward the new heaven and the new earth. And that's what all these guys were by faith. Remember, they didn't receive it on their own. They had to wait to receive it with us. Good. Well, let's close it out, the recording, and then we'll all jump in here. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, give us faith to receive and rejoice in your promises. Grant us to love and trust in you. And by that faith, forgive our sins and overcome our foolishness and cause your good and gracious will to happen with us and around us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.